Okay, so the subject of this school is uh, research. It's the hands-on, you know, school research, uh, school and complex systems. Um, even the uh, professional development work we've been doing has been focused on how to communicate your research more effectively uh, in different formats. But many of us wear a different hat, another hat at the same time, and that is we're educators. Uh, we have students uh, in the classroom. And so uh, what I want to tell you a little bit about is um, uh, there, there is uh, some information, even as people who are do primarily doing research, it's, there's uh, um, uh, advances in understanding of how to teach science. It applies to engineering, too. We have engineers, basically anything that's science, technology, mathematics, engineering, so-called STEM. Um, there's research in uh, effective ways, more effective ways in which and how to teach uh, these sorts of subjects. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, three aspects. First, how do you teach science more effectively? So I'll just give you one example. It starts from uh, some experience that we've all had as, as students, and that it starts from uh, the traditional lecture as the baseline. How do you improve upon that? I want to say a little bit about what is the science of science teaching. And then, um, although w many of us are involved with research and maybe exclusively research, let's see, how many people actually do teaching as well? Raise your hand. OK, about half of us in the room. And others who are researchers, maybe as graduate students, uh, but you're doing research full time, it may be in your future that you will be teaching. Or there may be skills that you would acquire uh, in the course of teaching that you would apply elsewhere. So I want to uh, say something about how that, you know, teaching and a teaching experience really advances your career as a scientist and as a, and just, and more generally, just beyond the laboratory and the, and the classroom. So everybody's been to a traditional lecture. We've had a number of these, although I would say many of the lecturers have uh, made the, uh, broken up the, the lecture where someone stands up in front and talks and everyone sits and listens. We, the lecturers have been uh, at the school have done a good job of breaking that up and getting you more involved. But I want to say a little bit about if you take the standard lecture and you're sitting in your classroom for 50 minutes or 70 minutes, uh, you might ask the question, how effective is that as a medium uh, by which you communicate information? So here's a, a story um, uh, and a misspelling, OK, with a K. <laughs> A renowned teacher and Nobel Prize winner, this is Carl Wyman, uh, who is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, uh, won Nobel Prize for uh, the discovery, experimental discovery of Bose-Einstein condensation. He was a lecturer and taught classes. And uh, he had this class on general physics, and he was talking about the subject of acoustics um, and gave as an example uh, the uh, example of a violin. And, uh, and said during the course of the lecture that explicitly told his students that when a violin string is plucked or bowed, uh, it vibrates. But that isn't what you hear directly. What you hear directly, in fact, is the vibration of that string is coupled to a bridge, this wooden piece on the top. And then underneath that top piece of wood, the face, there's a, a post called a sound post, which causes the back to vibrate. So in fact, that's what couples directly, acoustically, creating the sound waves that you hear. OK, so he, you know, he's known to give very clear lectures, describe this very clearly. What he did was ask, 15 minutes later, same class, he asked the following question to his students. The sound you hear from a violin is produced, A, mostly by the strings, B, mostly by the wood in the back, C, both equally, or D, none of the above. OK, 15 minutes later. So I'm going to ask you a question, not this question. I'm going to ask you this question. What percentage of that class do you think answered that question correctly? OK, so we have five choices. Now, each of you has, and we're going to use this, uh, use this uh, little device more than once. Um, this is a way in which one can uh, rapidly poll your students. If you have a large number of students, several tens or hundreds, uh, this is a way in which, as the lecturer, you can get some feedback 
on the, the question that you posed, okay? So let me tell you a little bit how this operates. So you can fold this, right, and then you fold it again. So you produce basically the four, uh, four answers, A, B, C, D, okay? And actually, in this case, we have five. The fifth answer is this, right? Okay, so just show this, okay. Now, um, I'm going to ask that everyone, uh, let's say, on the count of three, and this is also practice too, we'll all respond at the same time. We're going to do it in a way so that uh, the rest of the people in the class won't, you know, might be a little bit embarrassed about our answer, but we're going to, we're going to, um, so, so to keep, preserve, you know, our anonymity, we're going to answer by when I say one, two, three, respond, you'll hold the card up next to your chest like this. So people won't be able to see how you respond. You can keep, you know, preserve your, your uh, privacy that way, okay? So again, the question is, what percentage of the class answered the question correctly, okay? You know, having, again, let me emphasize, 15 minutes earlier, he said what the answer to the question was, okay? Answered A, 90% of the class, B, 60, C, 30, D, 10, or E, none of the class answered the question correctly. Okay, so you've had some time to think about it. On the count of three, everyone will hold up their answer card. One, two, three. Okay, so I'm, yeah, uh, okay, so I would say the dominant answer in this class, I'm just polling C. C is the, the dominant answer. I would say the next most is B. Um, we have uh, a pessimist back here. It says zero. <laughs> but I would say C and B, someplace between 30 and 60%. Here's the answer. 10%. Okay? Now you might say, maybe his class was a little, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning. Maybe they weren't awake. He's repeated this experiment over and over again to different audiences. So he's gone, he's given many colloquia at universities, and he's given a talk, he's posed a question, and then, or posed, or said some statement uh, about his research, and then 15 minutes later asked the question of the audience, you know, something that he had said 15 minutes earlier. And what do you think the percentage, this is the audience with graduate students with Professors, physics professors, what do you think the percentage of the audience answered the question correctly? A, a similar, a question that is a not obvious, so it, it deals with some subject that um, isn't really obvious, but if somebody tells you it explicitly, right, question is, is how much does, does the audience, upon hearing that somewhat counterintuitive explanation, how much, how, what percentage of the audience retains that? The answer is 10%. So this is a robust finding. It had nothing to do with the particulars of that class. Ken. That's right. That's that's exactly right because it, it's it has to be something that's not clearly let's say intuitive, right? Or there's no clear logical. Path. Right. Yes. Well, it's not unless yes. But the issue was is that um, there was a discussion of, in the example of the acoustics for the violin, there was a discussion of why the, you know, the sounding board in the back because and where, did, you know, the mechanism just as I gave, right? So, still, I think somewhat surprising that it's true. Yes. I didn't believe your explanation to begin with, right? Right. <laughs> right. I'm resistant. Let's say I'm I'm skeptic. Yes. So if so, this is a, an issue. So the question is, if the, if you were thinking that when you explain something very clearly to the audience and you've discussed the chain of reasoning, uh, and you maybe let's take the worst case, ninety percent of your class doesn't believe you, and they, that's what you do day after day, then maybe there's something that you need to be doing to try to make your lectures more effective, right? So that's really the the the, the point of this. All right, so the upshot of, of the, so the, so the reasoning behind why uh, just passive lecture is, is in many cases can be so ineffective is that it is 
passive. That is, when you're sitting there, you're listening, but maybe you're listening, maybe you didn't hear what the person said, maybe you're texting, you know, the variety of different things that can be going on with, with an audience while the lecturer is you know, basically communicating what the lecturer thinks is a very clear explanation. Um, a way to improve the audience understanding, the uh, student understanding, is to get students more actively engaged. That is, doing something active rather than just sitting there passively. And there are a wide variety of techniques for doing this in the classroom. One of these is known as peer instructions, very widely known uh, and, uh, and many, it's widely used in, in the uh, classrooms in the United States, not just for physics, but many types of different classes. How many have heard of peer instruction? Just out of curiosity, okay. So let me just sort of give you the idea. It can be done in a large lecture. Uh, and we're going to go through an actual example, which will be an actual question, which is rather counterintuitive. So you can see how this procedure goes and how you take the, the traditional lecture and you make this, this change, um, which I'll show you in a little bit with data uh, helps improve uh, student understanding. So first step is you give a lecture like you would. So you're presenting information, but you break it up into segments. So you think about it as being, let's say, in a 50-minute period, you have a, what we'll call a mini lecture. Okay, so our mini lecture for today is a uh, fluids question from fluid statics uh, that one sees in uh, many introductory physics courses. And it's on buoyancy, so-called Archimedes principle. And so I'll give that lecture in less than 10 minutes. Um, and the point is, the idea is, is that when you have an object and it's um, immersed in a fluid, then the corresponding force, the upward force, which we call buoyancy, is equal to the weight of the fluid that was the volume of the fluid displaced. So here I have my object immersed. It displaced this volume of fluid. And the weight of that amount of fluid is equivalent to the force, the upward force, the buoyant force on that object. Okay? And you can talk about it in more complex ways and talk about the pressure field and integrating around that, but that's sort of the, the, the sort of classical statement of uh, Archimedes' principle. Now, if you have something floating, then basically uh, the uh, upward force, the buoyant force, is the amount, uh, again, the amount of fluids that's displaced. In this case, a floating object doesn't displace its entire volume, but basically the volume below the water line, if you will. Okay? So that's the basic picture and basic idea. Any questions about that? Okay, so I've given the mini lecture. Now, step two. So rather than keep going and keep talking to you about more ideas, the next step is to stop and pose a question. So here's our question. Sunken treasure. So we've got a pirate ship that's floating on the sea and it's carrying a treasure chest. The treasure chest is dropped overboard and it sinks to the bottom of the, should be ocean or sea, okay? Now what happens to the sea level? Does it rise, does it fall, or does it remain the same? Okay, so again, think about this. This is floating, treasure chest on here. Pirate takes it, flips it, drops it overboard. It drops and sinks on the bottom, sinks to the bottom. What happens to the level of the sea? Does it rise? Does it fall? Does it remain the same? Okay, so you pose the question. The next step, you give each person a chance to think about it. Okay, so each of you think about it, but you don't talk to your neighbor yet. You're going to think about it, but just like we did before, we're going to vote in a moment in the same way, again, preserving your privacy. So I'll give you a, a, a little bit of time to think about it. You're a good audience, good student body, because most times students try to talk, then I have to sh shush them. <laughs> Okay, so let me fl flip back to the question so you see what the answers are, the choices. And I'm going to get a pen to record sort of roughly what I see uh, the numbers are. But I won't reveal them just yet. All right, on the count of three. Sorry? 
No, I'm not going to show them. I want to keep them here. <laughs> okay, on the count of three, uh, let me see your response. One, two, three. So we got quite a mixture here. Okay, let's see. Okay, so if you just hold them for a minute, let's see. Brian, don't look. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So I have I have the rough count. The, so the the advantage of doing this is I can see pretty quickly. I can already see roughly the numbers, um, and that's why to have the colors it allows you to, as an instructor, to see. Is most of the class on board, or are they, you know, do they, is there, you know, see, measures, it's a good way to measure. Unless the, I am colorblind, actually. These colors are saturated enough for me to be able to tell, so. Okay, so the next step is, after that, this is what, where the, the method gets its name, peer instruction. Turn to your neighbor, compare your answers, try to convince each other that you're right. So let's do that now, and you can talk. Chat with your neighbors. Sorry? Yes, you need to. Thank you. Checking, no one's texting, no one's falling asleep. Okay, let's, uh, let's pull it back together now. All right, so now the next step in this uh, is, after we've done this, is to vote again. Okay? So now you've had a chance to chat with each other, and I'll say a little bit about what one typically finds in this, but I'll have to see whether you follow sort of the typical uh, behavior of the audience on this question. Okay? So we're going to vote again. We're going to vote again. They're still discussing. <laughs> okay, are we ready to vote? <laughs> this is, yeah, this is, this is going to be, the, people get engaged like this. Okay, you guys are great students. <laughs> Just can't stop talking about it. Let's, uh, this is great. No, this is, th this sort of level of discussion, this, what, this is what typically happens when you pose questions. I didn't see anybody texting. I didn't see anybody like checking their email. Everyone was talking. So this is part of this. This is that shows you that part of why this technique is at least getting people engaged in, um, in, um, in, the, in the question at hand. Okay, so we're going to vote again. So same, same protocol on the count of three. Hold up the card of your favorite answer, whether the sea level rises falls or remains the same when the treasure chest is dropped overboard and sinks to the bottom. On three. One, two, three. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, so I see, uh, okay, so I'll tell you what I see. Um, I'm not going to do a, I'm going to do a rough count, but basically what I see is typical of what, uh, what does happen. Uh, what is the correct answer? The answer is the water falls. Do you believe that? No, let's don't believe it just because I say it. Let's couple that with something else. Let's couple it with a demonstration. All right? So let me show you. We have... Here is our pirate ship floating on the sea. It is there and there. Okay, this is, I dipped this out of the Adriatic, nice and green. Um, and so we have our floating ship, right? Okay, so it's floating. And I've got a roll of coins inside there. There's a treasure chest, right? Now, notice the level of the water, right? The sea, the sea is right up the brim there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the treasure out, right? Drop it into the bot, into the into the sea, and watch. Compare relative to that level whether the whether it rises, falls, or remains the same. So I'm pulling it out now and dropping it back in. So it falls, right? So what's what's the idea behind that? Let me just say a little bit about that. So at this stage, what you would do is you would recap. So I'll, let me just say what the results of the voting. When you first voted, it was about an even split between rises, falls, and stays the same. I would say that afterwards, the, the falls answer did increase, but there were still a fair number of rises and stays the same. But, it, but there was, a, was some progression in the direction of... of uh, the, the correct answer. Now, that doesn't always happen, but that's, in fact, what happened in this case. And depending upon what happens in that case, uh, let me show you, um, just say something about that. Flip back to the, um, flip back to this, uh, uh, the slides. That basically, depending upon what the reaction is, you'll change your response. So if students have had difficulty with that, you continue with the discussion. If you, people are mostly correct after having gone through this process, you move on, right? But that keeps the instructors, the instructor keeps in touch with where the students are, um, and so that gears the, the lecture much more to where the students happen to be in their understanding, okay? So this is a, another important aspect. So let me talk about the, the, uh, the recap of this. So uh, one way to think about it is, why does the treasure, the treasure is not sinking here, it's sinking here. There's a difference in the buoyant force, right? There's a larger buoyant force in this case than here, right? It's equilibrium here, so the weight of the treasure, which remains the same, balanced by the buoyant force alone here, okay? When it's dropped to the bottom, it sinks, and when it remains at the bottom, because now the buoyant force is less, it needs an additional contact force from the ocean floor. Buoyant force is smaller here than here. So that means the weight of displaced fluid is smaller here than here, meaning you displace less fluid in this case, right? So you displace less fluid in the sea, the sea level drops. Okay, so that's uh, the, the, the answer to that. So this is, um, uh, let me show you why this, something about some data on, does this have an impact? Okay, so let me indicate or show what this data, show, what the plots here are. So this is a comparison of, trying this technique out in a number of different classes, well, actually different level of techniques. So this is 1990, standard lecture. They would ask a set of questions, right? And then at the beginning, so they would do what's called a pretest about questions in mechanics, force in motion. They would give the same test at the end of the term, and they would ask the question, of the total fraction that the students could have improved, how much did they actually improve? Did they improve on their understanding of mechanics? So there was a baseline score. They took the test again. On average, there was improvement by the end of the term. That's what we would hope after a semester's worth of that class. And possible gain that they could have had. Okay. After they instituted this sort of interactive engagement, peer instruction, they saw basically a double of that sort of gain. 
And in, in addition, doing something else. This is not addition. There, there, so there are two techniques being applied here. The peer instruction as well as uh, a way of having students prepare for class in advance called just-in-time teaching. There's similar sort of data if you couple the peer instruction with lecture demonstrations, so-called interactive lectures. That also helps improve still more the uh, understanding of students. Okay, So this is uh, uh, an example of data. Let me show you one more thing, and then, Joe, I'll, I'll answer your question. This plot, busy, it's not, our, per, not up to the standard, but it's a very famous plot. It's not, it basically talks about, again, the same type of question. They have some sort of score initially, and the question is how much of the total amount of their possible gain do they actually gain? Now, the two classes of data here. One, if they just have traditional lectures, that's these. There's some type of interactive engagement, something to make the lecture more active, be these symbols. So on average, if you do something that makes students in your class more active, in participating in class, you get improvements in their learning understanding. Okay, so that's uh, sort of very general result. Question? Can you go back to the last slide? Yes. Why are the students evolving over time? Um, why does it evolve? Why are they getting better? Why are they getting better? Because possibly because they're getting more effective at the way in which they they uh, take the, you know, they, they give this test, or maybe there's uh, some transfer of information because they give the same test over and over. Could be some combination of those things. But the point is, is that, you know, there is this between here where there's no communication from prior years that suggests that there's, and this is the kind of thing that has, this, this plot also uh, is more data from, you know, hundreds of different classrooms. There's thousands and uh, tens of thousands of students involved with this sort of data, um, which suggests that that making the classroom, the lecture more interactive gets students more engaged. Okay? So let me say something a little bit, something about, yes, Eva. And you are and you're retrieving it in an active way, that you're actually engaged. So the whole point of learning is that you're, you're engaged with, mentally engaged in the material at hand. And however you accomplish that, you create this, the, the job of the teacher is to create an environment in which that sort of mental engagement is more effective. And so that's really the underlying um, sort of science, cognitive science. It has not just to do with the, the, the content, but it has to do with how people learn. And so this is, uh, you can connect it to neuroscience, that basically there are neurons connecting or re, it's sort of, as you're learning, learning processes forming these appropriate network of neurons. That requires engagement. Um, and there's, the, the more you can make the environment, learning environment engaging, the more effective learning is. That's really the underlying idea. Yeah, I more about why the 1994 students were smarter than the Yeah, so, so, okay, education research data has, you know, there's, it's not, it's not um, quantum electrodynamics, or you know, it's it has lots of spread. So you have to sort of look at it with a, a grain of salt. But if there are lots of repetitive studies, you see similar trends, then that gives you confidence, just like in any branch of science, that, that the findings are uh, have validity. Maybe the professors are getting better. Professors may be getting better. Yes. Yes. And using this method of uh, interactive engagement, it's obvious that you won't have enough time to cover so much. So how do you harmonize that? So this is a very famous thing that people have say, well, you know, we all feel this, right? Here's that textbook, which gets bigger and bigger every year. We got to cover the textbook, right? Uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, if they're not learning it, they're not, you're not, you know, you can feel like you're covering it, but if they're not learning it, 
what's the point? So the very famous quote from Victor Weisskopf yes. is, it's better to uncover a little than to cover a lot. Right. It's not the amount that you cover, it's the amount that you uncover, or something, well, something to that effect. Maybe there are some very precise we need to you know, have before getting to the next class. And no, maybe you are not the one to take them to the next class. And uh, you have to you know, give them this uh, preliminary before they get to the next class. So, so uh, these sorts of points, are, these are the sorts of things people are still struggling with. They struggle. There's a very important questions. Very, you know, Unresolved, I would say, how, how do we make sure that they're learning what we need them to learn in the next stage? But the question becomes, if they're not learning, and this is an issue that you, this is a common complaint one hears in instructors of advanced classes, didn't you have this course before and didn't you learn this material? If they're, so, so I think the answer lies in you have, to, you have to find and judge the right level, you have to try to make the environment in which you're teaching more effective, and you know there, and you try to coordinate as much as possible and identify what are the most important things that they need to carry on to the next level, um, because simply because you are talking about the subject doesn't mean the students are learning it. Okay, and so let me let me this actually before I go on, I have a, a couple of slides I want to say about that in a moment, but I want to say something. This technique I've told you about is one of many such techniques that have been developed through education research. I want you to, so these are really important places to take a look at, at uh, resources that you can use. Um, in physics, so you know, I know physics literature best. This is a repository, Compadre. It's called Compadre. Here are the websites for this. You'll have the links uh, that you'll be able to access when you download this. This has, a, in particular, this link leads to what's called a physics education research user guide. And it gives something like 60 different techniques. Every one is explicated of that. There are various levels of development, but they have, you know, what is, what is the research backing for this? How do you apply it? What is the appropriate uh, level of student for which this technique is useful for? It's really very uh, useful and comprehensive. Uh, if you're in a, teaching in another, uh, beyond physics, in you know, engineering, there is a superset of this. Compadre is part of what's called the National Science Digital Laboratory. And whether you're in engineering or you're in chemistry, there's a whole set of the different disciplinary uh, societies, different organizations have connected or put their um, education research literature, developed techniques there. So I, I really encourage you to explore these two if, you're, if you want to learn more about what are the possibilities. I've given you one such technique. Uh, there are many others. Um, so let me say a little bit about the education research, right? So we think about uh, at teaching as maybe an art or you know, you're, you're bo a born teacher. No, it's like anything else. You learn it. it there, is, there is a theory. There's evidence. There are experiments connected to theory. It's not the level of, let's say, doing physics, but it, it does give insight into how one can improve um, the science of teaching and learning. And let me just say a few things. First of all, teaching isn't explaining. This is one of kind of the, the major theme. A second major theme of this, this type of research is that experts, lecturers, you know, think differently than novices. And I'll say a bit about that. And there's something that's called cognitive apprenticeship. I don't know if I'll say too much about this. But the idea is the way that we learn. So it's actually built on the way we learn to do research. We're doing research under an apprentice. If you're a student, you're essentially an apprentice. You work in a small group under your supervisor. right? And how do you learn from your supervisor? You watch what your supervisor does. You go out and do things under your supervisor's supervision, right? You make mistakes. He helps you correct. But after a while, he does less and less of that as you get more further advanced in your career. So that assistance fades, and you become, after some time, after this period of apprenticeship, you become an expert. And this is the, kind of the idea that underlies a lot of the education research innovations, is to try to make the classroom more like that. 
not a, a, a classroom where you're just talking and you're passively listening, but to have it much be much more focused to create an environment where students can be mentally engaged and uh, take on, become more expert-like over time. All right, so here's a, you know, this is, uh, I should mention I got the, a lot of these are from uh, Ken Heller, who's an education researcher in physics at the University of Minnesota. So uh, I want to just acknowledge that. But usually we think about, you know, I'm lecturing and the students are, you know, they're taking it in. So they're like a, you know, a funnel. I'm funneling all this information in. Well, uh, we're frustrated because, you know, only 10% of the students, you know, learned it. So it's the students. They must be dumb or something, right? But students have a perspective, you know? I don't understand what this guy is saying. He doesn't communicate very clearly. So, you know, everybody's frustrated if you have this sort of picture of instructor speaks, students are supposed to learn, and that's the, that's the nature because the, the lecturer is giving a very clear explanation. And there's a lot of difficulties with this picture. Uh, and one of the chief difficulties is that experts organize their knowledge differently than novices, right? So for example, if we're doing a problem in mechanics, right? Block down an inclined plane. How do we think about it as physicists? Well, we say, what are the principles? What are the laws of physics? This is where we start, okay? And what are sort of then, with those laws, what are, you know, what are the sort of the general conditions? Equilibrium, non-equilibrium, uh, you know, how do we set up the description? And then we talk about the particulars, you know, it's a particular setting. Uh, there's a, there, what are the objects involved? There's a plane and a block. What are the interactions? You know, that's the hierarchy, starting from fundamental principles. Students don't organize their knowledge that way. They look at typically surface features. That's an inclined plane problem. There's a plane, and so on. there's an angle in there. And it's only very late when they said, OK, and then there's some set of equations that I need. So there's the, uh, the friction equation. So they have a very different way of organizing their knowledge. Now, the job of instruction is to try to help guide students from their novice way of thinking to more expert-like thinking. Right? And that's where this uh, making the environment more interactive, again, not telling students, but providing an environment where they, they are guided to uh, engage in exercises which helps them learn to become more expert-like in their thinking. Uh, it is, it, this, there's, no, there's no other way. Or, I mean, this, is just the, this comes from cognitive science research. Um, and I'll say uh, sort of the picture is the following, that the point of the lecture is to show, right, uh, what the, um, uh, sort of to model the correct behavior, the expert-like behavior. But just like if you're learning to play golf or you're learning to play soccer, you don't become an expert at soccer by watching someone play soccer, right? But you have to know how the rules of the game are work. You need, so it is informative, it's useful, but it's the starting point. And then you have to create an environment where the students are actually engaged in doing those activities needed for that particular subject. Okay, so it ha can happen even in the classroom. That's why pausing and having students talk to one another, engage and respond to a question under the supervi supervision of the, uh, of the expert, but it's helping the students engage rather than having the expert just continue to show. So now you're engaging them, uh, coaching them. This happens in the classroom, in recitations, and laboratories. Okay, and then eventually fade that support away as they become more and more expert-like. So the degree to which instruction can be um, modeled in that particular way and, and redesigned, and that's really, uh, I would say, the underlying objective of lots of education research is to create this kind of environment. Okay, I want to say one more thing about why is it worth spending time. So a common refrain that I hear from my colleagues in the department, as well as some students, is that you know, I'm here to do research at this institution, uh, and I'm doing a teaching, maybe doing what's called a teaching assistantship, and it's kind of a waste of time because I'm here to really become a researcher. And so I think, and others, particular under the leadership of folks like Ken Heller, is that this is a lost opportunity. That in, th in fact, if we think about the teaching and the time spent teaching as a, as a way to advance your career, there are lots of skills that can be learned in that sort of, sort of environment. 
And so it, it, it is uh, sensible to think about ways to try to make that teaching assistantship be something, uh, or teaching experience, and I'll think, thinking about TAs, being an, a, an opportunity to practice a set of skills that are helpful in the lab, you know, in doing research, and beyond in your career. Um, now, in terms of career, I mean, it's good preparation for employment. So the idea that, um, and this is also something that not everyone who is a graduate student becomes a faculty member, right? In the United States, this is certainly not the case. Um, only about 30% or so of the PhDs end up being faculty, but only about half of those in physics end up being uh, faculty at PhD institutions. So that means 85% in the US of PhDs in physics end up being uh, some in a position different from their supervisors. Okay, so that's me. Th th so this is a, a broad issue: preparing um, graduate students for to be become effective employees. There are lots of skills that you learn as part of teaching experience, which can carry over to that. Um, so, for example, if you're in industry, this is a poll that was uh, uh, from a um, uh, from this, this publication, which says, what are the sort of skills you need to be effective in industry? Teamwork, so you've got to work with groups, right? Communication, right? These are the sorts of skills that you get, can get lots of practice in, in, in a teaching environment. And government laboratories, so there was a talk by a supervisor, director at NIST, talking about the sort of qualities that it's important for physicists to have at government labs. And some of these are very much the kind that you would involve or acquire while doing research, but also while planning and organizing, leading, teamwork, communicating in the classroom. So um, what, we're, what uh, we're doing at Georgia Tech and others at other institutions are in, engaged in trying to make our TA, what we call TA training, but TA career development much more tightly integrated as part of a career development experience, global career development experience for our students. Um, and so there are various ways in which we're uh, changing the way we're um, teaching our TAs. But one key thing is we're getting our faculty involved with this. In the past, we would rely on basically having uh, someone who is not a faculty member just run the TAs through a Friday before training for the lab, before the laboratory and recitation. And now we're moving to much more to the model where faculty are taking charge of, um, of developing the TA training and because they are providing the model for uh, the graduate students to show that this is important and also then to help them practice techniques that are important for them to be more effective in the classroom, but also to help them practice these real soft skills that are important for their life beyond graduate, beyond the classroom, beyond graduate school. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop, but I just want to say one uh, summary point is to try these sorts of, there's lots of opportunities and ways to try a hands-on approach to teaching too, so I encourage you to explore it. With that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention.